Good morning. Happy New Year. Greetings from Northern Illinois, the land of the penguins, <laughs> polar bears, and Eskimos. I don't know if you're on Facebook, Bob and Cheryl are in Florida. So it's 48 there to me. That, I would take that real quick right now. <clears throat> so they're gone for a few weeks, and we're praying that they'll have a good time of rest and relaxation. Well, one of the things I love, I don't know how many have just seen the Star Wars movie. Are you a Star Wars fan? One of the things I love about movies is uh, when you go, when they take you on a journey, uh, The Wizard of Oz, Narnia, Alice in Wonderland, and uh, they kind of take you out of the mundane routine of your life for a few hours, and you go on this journey. And when I read certain portions of scripture, I always think to myself, wow, would this make an awesome movie. Now, sometimes Hollywood tries to, that Noah's Ark movie, I, was, man, was that, that was terrible. A couple years, was that two years ago or something? Boy, that was bad. But I always thought, wouldn't it be cool if Hollywood could take their money, their great actors, their great directors, and take the story right from scripture and make a blockbuster? Well, I was thinking of that because we're in, Luke chapter 2, and we're looking at Joseph and Mary and the story of Jesus being born, and there is an awful lot of stuff going on that would be very cool in a movie. Uh, we see angels and shepherds praising God. In the book of Matthew, we see uh, visions given to uh, Joseph, directing him, and all kinds of characters that Joseph and Mary are meeting, and miraculous things are happening. But I was thinking the difference between a Hollywood movie and, of course, the Bible is that the Bible's true. And when you think about the Bible, God is the author. God is the creator of this big story called salvation, redemption. He is the director. He's the producer. He's the one who chooses the characters in the story, which, by the way, you and I are part of this big story so it's kind of with that idea that I want to look at this text in Luke chapter 2. And I was thinking not only uh, from the fact of this journey that we're on, but it's this God that we worship. We know that God is sovereign, but it's not only that he's in control of everything as he's directing and guiding Joseph and Mary, as we've been seeing in all those events, but he's loving, he's merciful, he is perfect. So we can totally trust him as we journey through this life, just as Joseph and Mary were doing. So I want to propose this to you this morning, that because God is both sovereign and loving, this is why we can trust him as we journey through this life, just as Joseph and Mary did. Now, so far in this journey with Joseph and Mary, there's a lot going on. You remember that Mary... Uh, her relative, we think her cousin Elizabeth, old in age and barren her whole life, has a baby, John the Baptist. That's a miraculous thing. Then the angel Gabriel visits Mary and tells her she's going to have a son by the Holy Spirit and she's going to name him Jesus. Tells her she is favored. That's amazing. Then we see God sort of arranging uh, the Romans, taking the census. So Joseph and Mary had to travel from Nazareth to go to Bethlehem. So the baby would be born there, which was prophesied in the Old Testament, Micah 5, chapter 2. Another thing that's amazing and miraculous. Then we see an angel of the Lord and the heavenly host appearing to the shepherds out in the field that was right before where we're going to look at today in verse 21. So we see how God's sovereign and loving hand is just guiding in this whole process with, as Jesus is being born and I might say, in our lives too. So as we pick up the story in verse 21, we discover that Joseph and Mary, their journey brought a call to obedience. Now, all these amazing things are happening, but now they're just sort of getting back to the mundane things that Jewish husbands and wives do when their babies are born. They're going to go to the temple. They're going to have their baby circumcised. So let's pick up in verse 21. And when eight days had passed before his, Jesus' circumcision, he named, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he conceived, was conceived in the womb. 
And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now these verses from verse 21 through verse 40 are just oozing with Jewishness. Totally Jewish. Five times we see a reference to the Jewish law in these verses. We see a reference to the nation of Israel. We see a reference to the city of Jerusalem. But in the midst of this incredible journey and all the miraculous things that are happening with Joseph and Mary, they make sure that they do the things that they need to do. Obey the law. Obey the Jewish law. The first thing they do is they obey by naming and circumcising Jesus. Now, just as we saw with John the Baptist in that culture, when the baby would go on the eighth day to be circumcised, that's when they would name the baby. You remember that whole story where John, Zacharias loses his voice and <laughs> because his faith was sort of weak. He didn't believe that his wife was going to have a baby and Finally, they tell him in the temple at the circumcision, they want the baby to be named John, and that's when the baby was named. So here, the same thing. Jesus is being circumcised and given officially the name Jesus. Now, this practice of circumcision goes all the way back before the nation was even formed, back to Genesis chapter 17. And uh, the practice of circumcision was given for a few reasons. There was a health benefit to it. Uh, It would help stop infections or diseases, uh, sexually transmitted diseases between couples. It was a physical sign that would separate the nation of Israel for all the males that would be circumcised. Then there was a consequence, too, for disobeying this law or practice. If you didn't circumcise your son and cut the skin away for him, you would be cut away or cut off from the nation, excommunicated, kicked out. That's how serious this practice was. And we see it mentioned in the Old Testament, the New Testament, circumcision. But then there was also a spiritual object lesson. It came to be known as the cutting away of sin from our lives. So there was a spiritual component to circumcision. So to obey this practice was very, very important in the Jewish culture, in society. There were other practices, too, that were very important. A woman had to be purified after giving birth, and she would offer her firstborn son and present him to the Lord. So Joseph and Mary obey by purifying Mary and presenting Jesus. Leviticus 12, verse 1 to 8, gives us all the instructions for Jewish people following the birth of a child. For the male child, the woman would be unclean for 40 days after the birth of a boy, and she could not enter the temple. At the end of those 40 days, uh, they would come and offer either a one-year-old, spotless, unblemished lamb, and a pigeon was offered, or if they were poor, like we see here in the story, Joseph and Mary must have been poor because they offer two pigeons or two turtle doves as a sacrifice, less costly. But what's condensed in this, these four or five verses here is the fact that there was a different time period going on. First, they come to the temple, circumcise Jesus, but then at the end of the 40 days, they must have had to come back again and offer these sacrifices. There was one more element to the Jewish family. When they were offering their firstborn, they had to pay five shekels if their firstborn son was not part of the the Levitical family or a Levite. So that money would go to take care of the priests and the Levites and take care of the physical temple. So they're obeying the law. They're doing what God had called them to do in that culture. So in the midst of their journey, they're caring for their son, Jesus, who, by the way, has no sin, but they're still circumcising him, still going through all the the Jewish laws to fulfill all righteousness. And they were actually doing what Jesus later tells us to do in John chapter 14. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him or show myself to him. So maybe one of the first takeaways from this passage for us this morning is the topic of obedience. Certainly we're not called to go to a Jewish temple and offer sacrifices today, 
But we're certainly, as Jesus says in the Gospel of John, supposed to obey him. But it's a little bit different. It's not to be thought of as rigid rules or checking the boxes off and doing our duty. It's, it's a relationship that we have with Jesus, and we obey him because we love him. That's why we do what we do. And I was thinking maybe in this new year, there are some things that you might have been convicted that the Lord wants you to do this year. Maybe it's read through the Bible in a year. Maybe it's to start giving the Lord the first part of your income instead of maybe waiting till the end of the check and the bills. Or maybe there's somebody you need to forgive or confront or get together with or all kinds of things that maybe the Lord wants you to take away in your life or maybe add as a, as a loving act of obedience to him because you love him and there's a relationship that you're developed with him. So Joseph and Mary trusted God when their journey brought a call to obedience, but number two, they trusted God when their journey brought unusual blessings. This is the idea of trusting God in the good times and the bad times, and later we're going to see how Mary is going to go through some big-time bad times and some trials. But for now, let's look at the blessings. Joseph and Mary continue in their journey, and they meet two different people at the temple, Simeon and Anna. Now, Simeon has no title, but notice verse 25. He's not called a priest or a prophet, just a man. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So this man is devout and righteous. He's reverent, God-fearing, dedicated to the Lord, following the Lord, godly, spiritual, fill in the blanks, any one of those words. He really loves the Lord. Anna, a little bit later in the text, does have a title. She's called a prophetess. Look in verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. So the Lord is introducing in their journey, Joseph and Mary's journey, these two godly people come out of nowhere and are going to say some things about their child, and it's going to be some magnificent things. What I think is interesting about this whole story, even when we go back to chapter 1, is the fact that all these characters in the story are all described in a very godly and righteous way. Luke chapter 1, verse 6, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Mary, chapter 1, verse 28, was called the favored one. Joseph in Matthew 1, 19 is called a righteous man. And then here, Simeon, righteous and devout. Anna, serving in the temple, fasting and praying all the time. Do you get the sense that God blesses people who are devoted to him? want to praise him, want to follow him, want to serve him? I think so, because all of these believers, all of these people that are coming across the path of Joseph and Mary are righteous, and they love the Lord, they fear the Lord. So these are two righteous and godly people who, whom God is using and blessing. But notice how Simeon and Anna are blessed by the person of Jesus. First Simeon, in verse 27, as we saw, he comes into the spirit, into the temple, and the Lord leads him right to the baby Jesus, right to Joseph and Mary. And what does he do? He takes this little baby in his arms. Now, I, don't, I thought, the baby's not glowing. There's, there's not a halo over Jesus' head. This is a normal Jewish baby. But he's got an insight from the Holy Spirit to look beyond just the normal physical. He understands that there's something going on, and he's been waiting to see this promised Messiah, the Savior, all of his life. As a matter of fact, he's so excited when he sees this baby Jesus. He, verse 28 says he blesses God, and then verse 34 says he blesses Joseph and Mary. He's just like totally full of praise because he's seeing this promised Messiah and holding the baby right in his arms. 
But then notice Anna in verse 38 again. She's giving thanks and continues to speak of him to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. Now, I don't know how this really went down, but this is kind of cool to think about. If the temple was crowded, which it probably was, Mary and Joseph are just there obeying the Lord, and all of a sudden Simeon just comes up out of nowhere, starts praising God, and holds the baby, and I don't know if he was still holding the baby, and all of a sudden Anna comes right up while he's still holding her. Maybe, maybe not. The text doesn't tell us. But it's just interesting to think of this barrage coming at Mary and Joseph, these two people, whether simultaneously or even if there was some time in between there. Verse 33 tells us, his father and mother, Jesus' father and mother, Joseph and Mary, were amazed. They were astonished. They were marveling. They were wondering at all these things that Simeon and Anna are telling them about their son. And when you think about it, this started you know, long before this portion of Scripture. When the angels come to the manger and they're praising God, I mean, one thing after another is just like coming at them and they're just getting rocked with this marvelous miracle of who this baby really is. So Simeon and Anna are totally blessed by seeing the person or the baby Jesus. But I believe even more because they understood the purpose of Jesus, why he came into the world. Simeon and Anna are blessed by the purpose of Jesus. You know, it's one thing to see this beautiful baby right in front of you. But when you really understand through the Holy Spirit giving you wisdom what the purpose of this baby is, this opens up a whole new uh, line of praise as you're thinking about what this baby is going to do. The first purpose we see in the text is that he was going to be the consolation of Israel. Now, the word consolation means a comforter, an encourager, one who would bring solace, comfort in time of sadness. And I was looking at, the, in the original language, this is interesting, because the first thing when I thought of a, con, a consoler or a comforter, I thought of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, Jesus says, I will send you another helper when I go back to heaven. He will be with you and in you and upon you, the Holy Spirit. But here, I looked at the original language. This is a derivative of that same word, the paraclete. Para, meaning coming alongside somebody, a comforter that's going to come alongside and help you and encourage you. That's the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you if you trust the Jesus. But now Jesus is a comforter. So then I thought, wow, I wonder if the whole... Trinity is involved in this. And then did a little more digging, and you find you go back to the book of Isaiah, and you find that the Father is also called a comforter. So the whole Trinity loves us and is involved in comforting and consoling us as we journey through life, having faith and following the Lord. But then I asked myself, what is causing the sadness in Simeon? If consolation means to comfort you in sadness, what is the sadness? I believe it was twofold. First of all, there was a physical oppression of Rome. The people of Israel were sad because there was a foreign power ruling over them. I mean, imagine today if you were in Davis and the Russians or Chinese, you know, hopefully that would never happen, but took over the United States and you're sitting in your house, and the Russian government puts this puppet governor over Winnebago and Stevenson County, and you see Russian guards walking down the street with machine guns, and you're in your own town and your own state, your own country, but there's a foreign power occupying your country. That's the kind of circumstances they were living in. There was religious tension. Uh, the Jews were monotheistic, monotheistic. They believed in one God. The Romans were believed in all kinds of different things. There was financial tension, highly taxed. They were always looking for more taxes from the, from the Jewish people. There was a political tension. The, the puppet kings and governors they would put in place were not even Jewish, and there was some tension there. And then, of course, a military tension. Picture the Roman guards walking down, just like I was saying with the Russians, you know, walking down your street, fully armed with their swords. And, you know, if you look at them funny, they might, you know, beat you up or whatever or worse. So there was this physical oppression from the nation or the, the powers of Rome. 
But then secondly, I think there was the spiritual oppression from sin. Now remember, Simeon was devout and he was righteous. Now, as we're hopefully walking with the Lord and loving the Lord and wanting to be godly and holy, we should be hating sin, right? We would admit that sin is fun for a moment, and, but it's, there's always a consequence to it. I can't think of a time when I said something or did something sinful that I felt good about it. I wanted to confess and make it right, or there was a lack of peace in my heart. So Simeon is righteous and devout, so it stands the reason that he doesn't like sin. He doesn't like sin in other people. He doesn't like sin in himself. He doesn't like sin, see sin in his children, other people's children. We don't like to see sin in schools or, or our nation in general. So there was a spiritual oppression that he was desiring to be consoled or, or comforted from the spiritual tension of sin or the bondage of sin. So Simeon is probably looking for both the national and the spiritual consolation as he's looking at the baby Jesus as the comforter for his people. But there's another purpose of Jesus in the text. Verse 32, notice his purpose was to be the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. Now, if you go too fast, you're going to miss something because there's two people groups in that one sentence that don't really seem to belong together. Jews and Gentiles. As we know, most of the Jews, maybe all the Jews, there was tension between Jews and Gentiles for hundreds and hundreds of years. Jews hating Gentiles, Gentiles hating the Jews. We see anti-Semitism even today, unfortunately, in our culture. But we see these two people groups together in the same sentence, and we notice that they're together and this is the first time in the early in the Gospels that this mystery that Paul was talking about later in his epistles that was hidden for hundreds and hundreds of years, that Jews and Gentiles could both be saved by trusting the Messiah, by trusting Jesus as their Savior. That was the mystery that was hidden for all those years. And now when Jesus comes, it's starting to be made known. Notice verse 30 and 31, Simeon says, My eyes have seen your salvation. He's looking at Jesus, the salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, Jew and Gentile. So this wall of hostility that we read about later in Paul's letters is being broke down as Jesus is this light of revelation to the Gentiles. And in the midst of this Jewish, this is what's amazing, in this Jewish text, all of a sudden the Gentiles are just like a neon light popping out as the Lord loves the Gentiles just as much as he loves his own people. And I love what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 3, 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, the body of Christ, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, providing they trust Christ as, as their Savior. So this amazing miracle, as we're seeing really early in the Gospels, about these two people groups coming together. But the purposes of Jesus get even better. Notice what Anna says again in verse 38. At that very moment, she came up, began giving thanks to God, and continued to speak of, of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now we're talking about something spiritual. We're not talking about being freed from the Roman government. Here we are again, talking about being free from sin. So Simeon is looking for the consolation of Israel, the comfort, the encouragement, National, spiritual. Anna's looking for the Redeemer, and she sees him. He's right there, the Lord Jesus, to be freed from sin. She continues to speak to all those who were looking for the redemption, for the redemption of Jerusalem. He is the consolation. He's a light to the Gentiles, and now his purpose was to be the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, Anna is not contradicting Simeon. He's saying the light is going to go out to the Gentiles, too. She's talking about the redemption of Jerusalem. What I think is happening is that the text is saying that she's living in or near the temple. So every day she's there. That's her home. She's in the city of Jerusalem. That's her whole world. So she's probably saying that, even though she might realize that this Redeemer is going to save Jew and Gentile. She says that probably or possibly because she's just there. She's living in the temple in Jerusalem every single day. 
John 4.22 says that salvation is from the Jews. This salvation or redemption would go to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. Remember when Paul was planting churches in Greece and Turkey and the first century, he was traveling all over. He would always go to the synagogue first because salvation was not only from the Jews, but went to the Jews first. And if they rejected it, he was like, okay, I'm going off to the Gentiles. And he would preach the gospel and try to plant and start these churches. Now, just to review, the word redeem means to release by paying a ransom to somebody, paying a price, and then freeing them from prison or, or from jail. So both Jew and Gentile needed to be released from the prison of sin. And they would do that by trusting Christ as their Savior. So as Joseph and Mary are walking with God on their individual journey, they're being obedient, doing what they know to do, they're encountering all these kinds of blessings and different people they're meeting, hearing about their son, the Messiah. But it's all not roses and sort of daisies because... Um, they're going to need to trust God because their journey and their walk with God is going to get pretty unusual in, is with regard to trials. So their journey, number three, is not only unusual blessings, but their journey brought unusual trials. Now, many scholars believe that Joseph died early in the life of Jesus. We see, I think Jason's going to cover this next week, where Jesus is at the temple and he's 12 years old. And that's like the last time we really read about Joseph, and many scholars believe that he died fairly early. Because what's going to happen to Mary as she goes through her life and Jesus grows up and gets into ministry, she's going to need the strength of the Lord. We don't know if she got married again. But notice what Simeon says in verse 34 about Jesus, that Jesus would cause the fall and the rise of many. Jesus would cause many to stumble over him. We read that in the scriptures, that Jesus was a stumbling block. People just didn't understand. This person dies on a cross, and by have, placing my faith in him, then I'm saved. Many people just either didn't want to believe it, rejected it. He was a stumbling block. Many people would fall because they would reject the gospel, and they wouldn't trust Christ as their Savior. And we see this in many places as the people of Israel just totally, most of them rejected him. As a matter of fact, we see the small remnant of true believers, Elizabeth, Zacharias, Anna, Simeon, Joseph, and Mary, the small remnant, but most of the people, most of the Jewish people rejected Jesus. And Jesus said it himself in Matthew 10, verse 34. He said, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to divide families. You either follow me or reject me. Are you against me? Are you for me or against me? Do you believe in me or do you reject me? It was so black and white when he came into the world in the gospel. So this is what it, I believe is meant at the end of verse 35. The thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Our thoughts about Jesus reveal what's in our heart. Our words, the things we say. A lot of times we have this awkward moment where we're talking to a relative or somebody that we love and we, we don't want to cross this line and judge them and say, we don't think they're saved, so we sort of cautiously don't go there. But the reality is we can tell a lot about a person what they think and they say and they do with regard to Jesus. If somebody is mocking Christ at work and, and saying negative things about Jesus, he probably doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him. That's kind of a no-brainer. So I think that's what is meant here. The thoughts from many hearts may be, be revealed when you're confronted with Jesus, what do, you, what do you do with him? Do you receive him? Do you reject him? And if you receive him, your whole mind and your thoughts and your heart and your actions and how you live your life is going to change. Your heart is revealed because of what you think about Jesus. These are the ones who have trusted Jesus, the ones who rise. Some will fall, but some will rise. Hopefully, you and I are in this camp. I know I am. I'm not hopefully. I know I've trusted Christ. But Ephesians 2.6 says, God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there was the fall and the rise of many because of Jesus. But then also Simeon goes on and says Jesus would be a sign to be opposed, verse 34. And we know that a sign points to things, gives us directions. 
to where we need to go. And Jesus coming to earth pointed to the fact that God's kingdom came to the earth. We read that in Matthew 4, 17. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This baby, who Simeon was holding, grew up, started his ministry, and the kingdom was at hand, living right among them. And some and many rejected And this sign, this man, this savior would also be opposed. Jesus would be spoken against, rejected, denied. Remember him being tricked? The Pharisees were always trying to jack him over and trick him in some kind of little argument and catch him in something so they could could nail him, contradicted. And all this would result in insults and abuse and mockery and finally him nailed to a cross. So he was a sign to be opposed from those who would reject him. And Mary's son, Jesus, would cause the fall and the rise of many. Her son would be a sign to be opposed. But then there's this eerie statement in verse 35, a sword will pierce even your own soul. Jesus would cause a soul to pierce Mary's soul. Now, he didn't do this directly. It was his mother, and he loved his mother. But the very fact of who he was and what his ministry was about would cause her many trials as she watched him in his ministry. This was the most extreme sense of her suffering, watching her own son die on a cross. I can't even imagine that. It would be bad enough to watch your own child be killed, but in that type of brutal way, when she took a look at him, if you see, if you saw, seen the movie The Passion, if that was at all accurate of what Jesus went through I don't know how she could stand up without passing out and sobbing, watching her own son whipped and the thorns on his head watching him. We know she was there, John 19, verse 25 tells us, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, that is Jesus' aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. We don't see Joseph there, but she watches him die this brutal death. And many people, we could argue that Mary's suffering started right when she got pregnant. Remember, Pastor Bob was talking about when she got pregnant, the stigma that that must have been to be pregnant, and she wasn't married yet, and walking around, and her belly's getting bigger, and she's in this small town, and probably being mocked and ridiculed when she's pregnant. And then we see, or we're going to see next week when they're in the temple, and they can't find Jesus. He's 12 years old. We see this sort of... Jesus starting to pull away from his parents as he's looking, even at 12 years old, he's saying, I'm I'm about my father's business. And he's not disobeying her or Joseph, but he's starting to focus more on what he's really being called to do. And that probably grieved her heart too as he's pulling a little bit away from her. And she might not even have totally grasped what was going on with her 12-year-old son. Or she might have heard, I thought of this too, she might have heard when he was in ministry, whether she saw it or not, she might have heard people mocking him. Maybe she walked up to a group of people in Jerusalem and she heard about the Pharisees mocking him and ridiculing him, even as he's teaching and trying to trick him up, and she probably heard about those things. One interesting side note on Mary's trials, if you look at verse 39, When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, this is Mary and Joseph, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. Now Luke, for whatever reason, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chooses not to record what Matthew records about King Herod killing the babies, the wise men coming to offer their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We're skipping a whole bunch of things here because they, did, they eventually ended up in Nazareth, but they had a whole different journey going on when you put the pieces together and look at Matthew. After they present Jesus at the temple, they must have lived somewhere in Bethlehem because the wise men come, and the scripture says they come to their house. Most people, we think of the wise men coming to the manger. They came to their house, so they were living in a house somewhere in the In Bethlehem, they're following the star. They come and worship baby Jesus. And then King Herod issues this insane decree to murder all the babies two years and younger. That gives us a clue that says Jesus must, he wasn't a newborn anymore. 
He was somewhere between newborn and two years old, living in Bethlehem. Then we read in Matthew that an angel warns them they need to get out of there because Jesus is going to be killed by Herod, so they go to Egypt. So as we're thinking about this journey, they go to Egypt to escape Jesus being murdered. They stay there for a while. Then they come back to Judea, and they find out Herod's dead, but then his son is ruling. So they're like, well, we're not going to Judea. And that is eventually how they end up back in Nazareth, and where we hear the title Jesus of Nazareth. So for whatever reason, there's a lot of details. There's a lot of trials, and I couldn't help but think Mary had to have heard about what Herod did to all these babies. And I bet that grieved her heart, too. Not, maybe not that she was blaming herself or whatever, but anybody would be grieving hearing about this. Somebody, do you hear, did you hear what King Herod did? He just killed all the babies in our hometown there. I mean, that must have really grieved her heart, too. Again, more trials, not only the blessings through their journey, but many trials that she's going through, too. But as I was reading this text and just praying about it, I always kind of read and try to think, what can we draw from the text that we can apply to our lives today? Not just so that we're reading some story, but many of us have gone through trials this year. Many of us have lost loved ones. I know Steve and I both lost our dad. Uh, there was love, other people that lost loved ones this year, passed away. There's people battling cancer in our church. There's people having struggles with jobs or financial troubles and trials. So as we're on a journey, just like Mary and Joseph were, they were in different circumstances, but we're following the Lord. We love the Lord. And we have, to us, these trials are just as real as those trials were to Mary. And we've already been challenged by the fact that we need to be obedient to God and whatever he reveals to us. We've seen uh, the character traits of all these people in the stories, this remnant of believers, and hopefully we desire to be like that, devout and spiritual and godly. We've seen these unusual blessings that God can bring into their lives and also to our lives as we journey and walk with Jesus. But we also see these realities of these trials in our lives as we journey through life. Here's the good news. And that's why I was thinking about the sovereign God who's loving. The same God who's in control of this whole story, this whole movie, this whole drama, if you will, from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, we're part of this journey. The same sovereign and loving God who directed and cared for Joseph and Mary all through their blessings and trials is the same God that's going to direct us through our trials. That's some of the lessons that we can draw from this. It's the same God. He loves us the same way. And he's going to be there for us, directing us too, and blessing us, even through these difficult trials. And maybe one of the, another takeaway from the story this morning is to remind ourselves that these Bible characters are not like some superheroes. They're, they were just like us. They went to work, they cared about their children, they, want, they cared about their children's health, they cared about working, they had to do the same things, get up and take care of themselves. The same things that we care about and that, that we do every day, God loves us just as much as he loved them. Just as much as he loved Zacharias, Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, and what I think is the most incredible thing, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're in his family, he loves you just as much as he loved his own son. Amen? That's the truth of God's word. And that might be the, one of the best takeaways for us this morning. So we think about the sovereign, loving God and this journey that we're on. All of us in different places, different gifts, different talents, serving him, loving him, following him. The same God wants us to obey him. He wants us to be devout and righteous and godly. He wants us to accept blessings and trials from his hand and still follow him and still worship him and still praise him. So as we think about this, as we leave this morning, I just wanted us to read this very familiar verse. I wanted us to read it out loud. This seems to be appropriate. Romans 8.28. This will be up on the screen. Let's read this together. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's a great way to end, isn't it? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for some of the things that we learned from the story, and we, 
uh, forgive us for reading your word and sometimes, I don't know, maybe just not believing it, maybe thinking that these people and these stories are just somebody different with supernatural powers or something. And help us to recognize that when we're reading your word, these are people just like we are and you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And you love us. We thank you for that truth this morning. And we're thinking about this new year of 2018 and our desire is to be more godly, more devout, more spiritual to following you and loving you. We, we don't understand a lot of times why we suffer, why we go through things, why things happen. But we want to trust you. We want to understand that you are in control of all things and that you are loving and merciful and perfect and holy. And we thank you for showing us these things about yourself and your word. And we want to believe it. We want to walk in it, and we even want to support each other as we go through blessings, rejoicing in each other's blessings as the body of Christ, or even helping each other to comfort each other as we go through trials. So thank you for the story in Jesus' name. Amen.